Beardy and the Beast Media Club. This is placeholder intro song. Hello and welcome to Beardy and the Beast Media Club, where we'll not shy away from the spoilers. We won't use our connections to vaporize spoilers via airstrike. We're available here and on other services with a complete dossier at beardyandthebeast.com. Like, subscribe, but if you appreciate what we do, share us with your friends. My name is Drew, and of course joining us is fellow Black Ops team member Devin. Yo. Today we'll be discussing the 2010 movie adaptation of the comic The Losers. So Devin, did you like the angle of this movie's dangle? <laughs> you know, I'm going to say the angle was just like a bit off that, you know, 90 degrees that you'd be looking. <laughs> <laughs> so it, 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 there was one thing that dangled to the side just a little too much uh, that was really the only thing that pulled me out of the film. Uh, for the most part, I it was an absolute blast. Mm. I was laughing so much throughout this film i i do i do i do love the fact that we finally um were able to view a comedy yeah <laughs> uh no this is this this movie is prime popcorn flick yeah this is you know chocolate covered whatever's in your mouth um salty sweet popcorn just going down yeah. having a good time you're just on the roller coaster for a ride yeah yeah it starts at a high and just yeah you just roller coaster is a great way of saying it. it's like it you know on tracks like i mean you, you know for the most part what's happening it's that again that super tropey movie mm -hmm. knows it's tropey mm -hmm. and and follows it follows it pretty consistently and in fact just to kind of go to the i'm gonna start off quick just get it out of the way yep um it's actually the one the the one part that actually jumped me i found hurt the film or at least hurt my viewing of the film mm -hmm. was um the 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 trope when you have these five-man band type films there's a traitor yep right we know this and i think they set up very well Aisha being the traitor, like as a red herring, but I mean, it was also in my head that this is going to be a red herring. And I almost thought because of that, they wouldn't truly have a traitor moment mm. because I don't think they set up Rock's betrayal properly. It literally, it felt to me completely like it came out of left field. And to explain that a little bit further. I understand that he had that bit of antagonistic relationship with, with Clay. Yeah. But I mean, that's generally a second in command role. He was antagonistic with Clay by constantly saying, I don't want to get back into this shit mm. to turncoat by getting back into that shit. It definitely felt to me like a, how would you put it? They got to a point in the screenplay or the script writing and then just went, oh, wait. Yeah. Uh, mind you, you're, you're probably like me and you don't have, you're not that familiar with the original Vertigo comics from the early 2000s. Right. Uh, I know that there was a combination of two different storylines to make yeah. up this movie. So like, that's where the jump could have came. They didn't have a yeah. proper setup because they jumped from one section of the story to a completely different one. Yeah, and apparently I think it was something like most of the story was volume one and then like half of volume four. So Yeah, um, it's so, probably I mean, the half of volume four that you're feeling. Yeah, and and that makes that makes sense from the I guess from the adaptation side. Um it's just like as a good explanation. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately it's a crappy excuse yeah it's it, it doesn't excuse it at all yeah oh yeah you're 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 definitely on track with something that i kind of felt with it i 
I am I had seen this movie before, and right. while I was watching it, I I wanted to ask you uh, how much you were able to tell or see the telegraphing, or not telegraphing, but the um, the clues and the tidbits leading to Rogue's betrayal, because they weren't very straightforward. It, it wasn't someone <laughs> who, you know, was obsessed with himself or wealth. It was really just someone who was fed up with the, seemed to be fed up with the life, and then yeah. just all of a sudden turned. So I wanted to get your pers- perspective on that, and I think you uh, laid it out pretty well. Yeah, I think I think that's really the biggest thing is like, of I could have seen Jensen or Pooch making that trade off because you know for the security of their families, which yeah. was definitely clear on there, right? Uh, Clay didn't really have anything. And as you said, like they just didn't set up rogue enough mm. to, to give the actual motivation for doing that. And yeah, I think they set up the opposite motivation. Um, again, very possibly a lost in translation thing. Um, a little bit looking at the tropes. I mean, obviously tropes don't replace reading the source material, mm. but it seemed implied to me that they kind of did the same thing in the comics, but you can kind of get away with a little bit more. Like apparently in the comics, like you, they think fig- they figure he's dead in one of the missions and he comes back a few missions later, uh, basically in Wade's position in mm. the comics. Um, and you know, apparently there's like a line type thing where it's, where he says, you didn't check a body. You taught us to check for a body. <laughs> right? So, which is kind of nice that they play with those tropes in the comics. Um, but yeah, it almost sounded like it might have been a kind of weird jumping off point in the comics too. But again, mm. that's just going from the tropes. And, I mean, tropes in that regards are worse than Cole's notes. Yay. Cole's notes at least give you context, so. <laughs> that's true. Is as far as your like action five man band adventures, I think this one was definitely summed up nicely. Mm. I, I like the characters; they were different enough, and they had your um, archetypes that you would expect. Yeah, you had your 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 gruff leader. You had your, you know, your wisecracking techie. You had your capable yet sly fast talker. Yeah, uh, you. You had your gruff rebel and your, you know, your, your quiet, but very skilled yeah. person. And then of course the st- strong sixth ranger. Yeah. This, <laughs> the sixth ranger, like strong willed driven fits in well. Yeah. Like there, there was an open uh, slot in the puzzle for them and they, they fit in well, well after uh, some finagling. Yeah, and I, I feel like they actually introduced um, Asia very well mm. in that. Like, I mean, it, she wasn't attack on. There, there's the the trope, you know, when you're doing tabletop games. Mm. Hello, fellow <laughs> adventurer. I trust you implicitly. <laughs> right. They didn't do that. <laughs> no, there was tension around it, and it makes sense. They're a burned unit. They know that someone coming in and knowing who they are all of the alarm bells should be going off. So. Well, it, it was clear in the writing and the acting and the way that it was laid out that they were suspicious of Aisha the entire time. They were using her because she was financing them, getting them back into the country and helping them, you know, yeah. proceed with the mission. They never quite trusted her. Yeah. Until, you know, she came through at the end. Yeah. And even then, like, I imagine if there was a part two and it seemed to me like they they wanted to get like a series going with this mm. that there there would have been some more friction in the second one yeah uh, likely not in the same manner but it would still be like some being cautious around her yeah yeah it takes a bit to to build that trust and mm-hmm. that makes sense they're a black ops unit <laughs> that <laughs> got burned <laughs> like hard burned by the CIA yeah well, they burned themselves too, right? Like, yeah. Which 
which was really smart. It's actually a detail that I really liked um, with Pooch when during that burning, when when they burn themselves, not having the ring on his dog tags. Mm. So, uh, of course, when he actually does see his wife again she's like she's gonna she's gonna kill me when she finds out i'm alive i'm like no her reaction was exactly what i expected she knew you were alive because the ring wasn't there yeah it was such a subtle thing you didn't need any more than that well there's Um, there's some stuff in this movie that was like strangely complex for the type of movie it was Mm -hmm. uh the the biggest thing to me was uh the ring Of course, with Pooch. I think if I were to go back and pay more attention to Jensen's shirts, Mm. there there might have been some type of theme or scene description in the shirts or like maybe a signifier about what's about to happen next. Yeah, I I felt the same thing. And of course, didn't, I mean, of course, being a first viewing and, you know, didn't, the first shirt that gets pointed out is, petunia's shirt <laughs> right they're obvious reason that they're you know just the joking the riffing and you know get that little bit of backstory for him and then so i didn't really think to pay attention to the shirt it was like oh crazy shirt guy and then it was that like that weird hot dog shirt i'm like i should have been paying attention to these shirts <laughs> yeah, yeah if, if if anyone out there has a theory on those shirts you know post it below comment because i i would really like to know and i didn't see anything in my readings mm-hmm. after this yeah because there's something pro- prophetic about jensen in general mm-hmm. there there was one scene where he was practicing his golf swing and talking to pooch and he just goes through this huge plot analysis and character breakdown about uh, about the movie and then goes into his like funny cat and dog fact which yeah. also applied to the movie. Yeah. That was the whole um, talking about Clay not wanting to be called Colonel anymore. Was it Colonel? Yeah. Yeah. And that was him kind of signifying that he had lost his identity and his place in the world. Yeah. And this is something Jensen, like the the wacky guy, was going on about. And then he goes to onto some foreshadowing by saying, like, did you know... Uh, dogs only make 10 sounds where cats uh, make upwards of a thousand and that you can't trust cats. Yeah. Which was at a perfect timing to help make you mistrust Aisha. Yeah. But I think that cat comment was actually uh, pointing to uh, Roke because the way that Roke and Clay's relationship was involved was very cat and dog. Okay. It's it's how it just, came off to me. So I think that was one of the red herrings kind of pointing you towards Aisha. But in the end, I think this this I, ended up being one of those complexities that I really enjoyed and I didn't remember from before and helped flush out this movie from being something a little bit more than that action popcorn flick. Yeah. And yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. And that could be part of it too. It's hard to to tell where the red herrings were Mm -hmm. because again like you know when when you think of a cat more traditionally we think of them as feminine Mm -hmm. right the cat tropes you know you have cat woman not cat man right so like i definitely can can see that being used as that red herring Uh, again if there was something i mean Something like a little more subtler that was just there tying rope to cats, maybe. Well, for me, it was the standoffishness, the claws out, the more independent mindset that Roke seemed to have, whereas uh, Clay was more pack orientated. Okay. Uh, that was my thought behind it. Okay. Yeah, I guess I, I didn't see that the same way because i i wasn't seeing the pack mentality in that regards i was seeing them both looking out for the pack Mm. but having different ideas of what that meant i could see that perspective right so so i was seeing him more as you know again the second in command someone who's there to question the orders of the captain right but no 
how to push properly or break break rank when has to type thing, right? Whereas um as opposed to seeing him as the star scream where you can tell it's like, yeah, he's doing it, but he's always trying to stab him in the back. I looked at that more as a uh Worf to Commander Riker as Commander Riker to Captain Picard. There's a particular scene where Worf cap, um, questions Riker when Riker was in command. Yeah. Uh, in front of everyone, and then he takes him to his office, and it's like, uh, I, I question the captain all the time, but you you do so in private if um, you have those like type of words. Yeah. Mind you, having some more history of the characters would be nice given all that because we know that they're a group they've been together they've been through a bunch of stuff they were able to establish this that right away that they had these you know character tra uh, traits and histories immediately yeah there was no development there all the bonds were assumed yeah so you do a lot of just writing the history of the characters together based on your perceptions from the movie yeah. Where they never actually explicitly said anything or yeah. even showed anything. They're just like, oh, you know, uh, you remember that when when they were they had all those like seized weapons that they were playing uh high yeah. card with. That's what they used to establish like a history. Yeah. That being said, if I really enjoyed the intro of this movie <laughs> because it was able within thirty seconds to introduce the characters their archetypes and their bonds yeah and then just get on the road yeah and i mean i i wouldn't want to see that in every movie obviously but for this movie it worked really well uh like just straight up here's each character they each have a line that represents their what type of character they are and then gives you a little idea of their place in the the family the unit yeah in the band uh, and they they each definitely followed that trope uh character that we were kind of talking about before yeah but i think each of them each of them had a motivation except for cougar which he was the quiet guy yeah they didn't really get into that but each character had a unique motivation each character had a unique personality there was no real overlaps. I think overall I liked probably J Jensen and Cougar the most in this film. Mm -hmm. Jensen, just because I like that, you know, that Wash character. And Cougar, because I like the quiet but skilled guy. Because he's yeah. always able to do something just like super badass. Yeah. Nonchalantly too. Yeah. <laughs> Is, as far as comms and tech go i really wonder about jensen's capabilities <laughs> there, there may be reasons behind that that most people would never see yeah as you know i i know a little bit about tech i know at least three things about tech okay. and i noticed once they had gotten the decryption key and they were decrypting the drive Jensen was sitting there in the all users directory on his computer and he did a net boot followed by a trace route and then some random scripting came up and I paused the movie and I was like wait a minute and I squinted and I'm like that's a web page source this is this is a web store for something I may have done the same thing <laughs> <laughs> and I was like wait a minute and I found out afterwards it was for some math application called MathCore to help you, like, learn algorithms. Yeah. <laughs> Mind you, there, there, there's a lot of texts that would roll their eyes at that sort of thing. But I, I find it immensely entertaining. I actually think this sort of thing is an inside joke. Yeah. Well, well it's funny because I, I, I paused it at the same time because I'm like, is he decrypting this drive by running a trace route? Yeah. And I'm like, okay, at least at least he was trying a net boot. 
I don't know why he's trying to trace the route of the net boot afterwards, but <laughs> I mean, I'm like, at least these are commands that make sense from some, from a networking standpoint. <laughs> so I kind of appreciated that it wasn't just like gibberish. Um, and yeah, I do wonder if it was supposed to be an inside joke with the, the app. Well, it's like the, was it was that that NCIS episode where their system's getting hacked and uh, the girl's on the computer and she's like going crazy, kind of typing and windows are coming up and somebody else comes up and starts typing on the same keyboard next to her. Yeah. And they're doing it even <laughs> faster. And I'm just like, this is my kind of humor. I love this. I, I yeah. love seeing. <laughs> like the, was it Jura Jurassic Park? And it's like, oh, this is a Unix system. I know this. I learned this in school. Floating around hacker style. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, it's impressive that she knew Unix and she learned it in school. Because I'm pretty sure people in school don't learn Unix. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, Unix. That, <laughs> this is like 92 or whatever. If she was in high school, like, <laughs> if they could afford a larger computer. It would have been an Apple II and she would have been playing uh, Oregon, Trail. <laughs> Oregon Trail. Just like we did. <laughs> We we used to take our mice. We used to take our mice and plug them into the computer um, on the other side of the table, and then yeah. like mess with the people who were on their computers because yeah. multiple mouse ports for some reason. <laughs> oh. Anyways, back on track. Uh, Jensen and his infinity tech skills to the greatest scene ever filmed, which of course is the elevator scene. It's so good. <laughs> I was sitting there because in, in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, this is the first time Devin's going to see this. No. Oh, it really? It wasn't. That's what you sent me to get me <laughs> into this film. <laughs> it was just as good the second time. <laughs> <laughs> I just love during that that scene too, where it's like, "Oh yeah, I knew I need to get him out of the office. How do I do that? Oh yeah, someone just exposed himself to a bunch of women in the elevator." <laughs> uh, I wonder what what did you think of the villain Max? I. I think in another movie, it would have irritated me. But because of the tone of the film was set so early, he was just your straight up. He is definitely the bad guy. Mm. And, and that unremorseful bit. Um, and, you know, it gets called out on it a few times too. Like um, when when Wade throws the guy off the, yeah, off the building, building because of the nod and, and his response isn't, isn't exactly a, I can't believe you just did that. It's like, come on, that was a punch him in the face. nod, not a throw him off the building. nod. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think so. I, I didn't mind that over the top and comic booky mm -hmm. type type villain from him. Uh, I think where I, I'm not sure if it's a message they were trying to put there and again from the source material or something like that. It's like he's a government, you know, high up government military intelligence type thing, and I understand that he's supposed to be there to you know get his hands dirty you know, that they can disavow. I mean, if there was, an, was any other film, I'd be going, it's like, did you really need to be that insane to, mm. to point it out? But I feel like it fit the tone of this movie fairly well. Like, it didn't, he didn't, I wasn't taken out by, by I, how over the top that was. I agree. I, I like the, part of it was the, the humor's, the interactions that he had with Wade were in the 
same humor vein as say Hooch and Jensen. Yeah. Like the way that they would kind of riff off each other a bit. Like yeah. it was in this it, it obviously wasn't the same type of interaction, but it was in the same vein of humor. So yeah. it it kept the the tone on point. Yeah. Yeah. That that that's exactly how I felt with it, right? Um you know, another character that I can find being over the top is I uh, can't remember his name. Zoolander, Will Ferrell's character. Still kind of that same over the top wahaha evil plan type thing. Uh and again, it fits the tone. Mm-hmm. So so um if this was a villain in most other movies, it'd probably go and it's like, yeah, you pushed it. <laughs> yeah, if you if you tried to slap Max into the A team, it wouldn't have worked. Yeah. But yeah, no, they they definitely had and yeah, it was nice to have the the villains having that same type of relationship as the as the protagonists. Like it's like, yeah, no, I'm doing this for the American way. It's like I'm from Quebec. <laughs> <laughs> for the North American way. Yeah. <laughs> Just shrug. The No, I I like to overall I like how he was so unrepentantly evil. He yeah. was just like, yeah, I'm gonna sell these two terrorists with the one prerequisite that they will use them. Yeah. There's no holding hostages, you will blow something up with these snooks. And I was yeah. like Man, you evil. You evil. <laughs> I mean, again, it's it's like they did the same things to to set up his character again, even before you saw his character, right in in the opening mission, right? It's like, okay, we know these are the good guys because look, here they are doing exactly what they just said they didn't want to do to save these kids. We're like, would you rather fight fifty people with AKs? No, this is good. Well, it looks like we're fighting fifty people with AKs. <laughs> to get the kids out you know there's not enough room on the helicopter cool let's get the kids on and my notes here just say oh no 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 no, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh you knew something bad was gonna happen then it's like oh yeah max just blew up like a dozen kids and i'm like i'm not okay with this yeah <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah to be fair Max didn't know he was blowing up kids at that point. He fully was fine blowing up kids, but yeah. Well, they established him so well that if you knew that if he had foreknowledge that there was kids in that helicopter, he wouldn't have cared. Mm -hmm. He he wouldn't have done anything different. Mm, I will slightly disagree. (laughs) And it's not, I agree. Kids being on the helicopter doesn't change his opinion. He wouldn't have done it because he wouldn't have hit the right target. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> um, he wouldn't accept the kids as a shield. But I don't think he's going out just to kill the kids. So. Um, which I guess is because, I mean, I, they, they tried to use the kids as his kick the dog moment. Mm. Right. And. At the very least, they established that when they said no abort because of the kids. And, you know, I can also understand the unfortunate casualties that can happen in situations like this, assuming it's a legitimate operation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Um, right. Definitely trying to minimize that. Um, so, because of that... I think, I don't think that that moment, like thinking about it in retrospect, actually is quite the kick the dog moment that it should have been. And it's because, again, you know, not knowing until later in the film that this operation was happening because the guy was going to turn on him. Mm Mm-hmm. At that point there, you can go, okay, well, these are, these are the bad guys, right? And it's, un- there are kids there, it's like, well, we can't abort the mission, this still needs to go through. I, I can, 
Well, no, I don't condone that. I can understand understand that from a larger scale real world um, idea. So him not aborting the mission isn't quite the kick the dog moment, but can be. Him blowing up the kids also isn't his kick the dog moment because... He didn't know the kids were on there. He didn't know it was the kids. So while for an audience it does definitely set up the yeah no he's the bad guy it's unfortunately accidental now that i'm thinking about it and it's just the protagonists just are like this bastard just tried to kill us you know get get a revenge as opposed to um i mean it, it works it's just kind of one of those things like when you think about it, it's like I mean, maybe if there wasn't the other established stuff how he is for the villain that in and of itself might not have actually been the evil outside of. Well, I think what we've established here is that between the two of us, you're the villain, which unfortunately would make me the protagonist. <laughs> oh, I don't want to be the hero in this duo. <laughs> no, I, no, I agree. Um, I think, I think the evil defining moment, if we were to get super analytical about it, would probably be the statement that he would sell those bombs to terrorists with the prerequisite that they use them. Yeah. And that's purely it. I, I had an assumption in my head throughout the entire movie that he knew the kids were on the helicopter, but you pointing it out kind of enlightened me to the fact that no, yeah. he didn't. Yeah. Well, I mean, you think about it, and, and there's definitely plenty there to establish his evilness, of course. Like, even just the idea is, like, he had no idea who this, these people were. This is like, no, nah, this is just a regular thing he does. Um, I actually really liked it when he did that. It's like, yeah, that was 18 people. Yeah, I'll kill them all. Did you know any of them? Yeah, one of them was his brother-in-law. Oh, was that going to be a problem? No, I said I'd do it. <laughs> I, I, I really enjoyed that interaction. <laughs> oh, there, there's definitely good laughs throughout this entire film. Yeah. I think... There is something off its self about the film. Mm-hmm. And I... I think it does kind of lead into the way that they they seem to be half-heartedly leading up to a sequel. They were trying to set that up. It wasn't quite standalone to me, and it made it feel incomplete. I need a little bit more around that. So I, I don't think I got that same feeling. Mm. Um, and there's a big difference between... setting up for a sequel and leaving room for a sequel. Mm. So I don't feel like this movie was setting up for a sequel, setting up for a sequel, but definitely made it so we could have more adventures of clay in the gang. I mean, if they came out with losers to more adventures of clay in the gang, I'd probably go see it. Well, Oh, for sure. When they're <laughs> yeah, in a theater or some such. Yeah. I just, I was something about it like, villain gets away, the gang's all together, the betrayer is maybe dead. Mm. Uh, but I guess the overall, was there a resolution? I don't see why they would be let back into quote unquote normal society. Like if you if you were to think about it that way, they they wanted to okay. get to the servers so that they could expose Max and get their life lives back. You're right. But there was no exposure. There was no data there. That was a trap. So yeah, that, and even even then, when uh, Pooch is seeing his seeing his wife when, when she's giving birth, there they did it as a as an op. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, you're very much, you're right there, actually. Um, hmm. Yeah, there was no, yeah, there was no actual conclusion. I'm just coming to this now. There's no conclusion to this, this movie. Um, 
I think. So there was a conclusion to the story. Yes, the story is laid out. Yeah. And and this is why I can now kind of see where you're coming from about the the sequel mm-hmm. hooks. I don't I don't think it was meant as a sequel hook thing. I think it's almost more like what happened with Rogue you missed something you've shown us that after this happened, they were allowed to get back to their normal lives without showing us how they got back to their normal lives. Mm. So yeah, that's why I still disagree with it about, about it begging for a sequel in that regards. It's just, I mean, I guess that's, it could, it could be. just be, that wasn't the interesting part at that point. True. Like, how, True. Well, I mean, I've seen this movie a couple times, and I didn't yeah. notice that until, like, this moment. Yeah. It it also could be... It it felt like it came off as a comic book volume one. Mm-hmm. So if I explain it in that manner, it definitely makes a whole lot more sense. Yeah. Like, there, there should eventually be a volume two, but, like, you could read this as a standalone. Yeah. And they they did end up bringing was it Andy Diggle and Jock the creators of The Losers mm. um, on to like help work on the film and help advise. So I'm wondering if they had some input on the the screen screenplay or even the directing. And I'm I'm actually beginning to wonder how much uh Sylvan Wythe, the director I'm wondering how much of a comic book fan he is. Okay. Because he he did uh, specifically re- request the creators come on board, which might just be him being artistically responsible. Mm. Like, wanting to make sure that he gets things right that might otherwise slip by. Right. But I'm also wondering the way that the shots were structured. Mm. Uh, the biggest one is when Aisha saves, saves the gang by shooting a rocket launcher, su- super heroin style, like great scene, but the way it was framed and the way it was colored was just straight out of a comic book. Like yeah. you would expect that if it, if drawn to be on the next page and maybe like, uh, uh, yeah, they're called centerfolds in, uh, yeah. Uh, comic books as well yes like a two-page spread and it was just it was that badass moment that you just needed somebody to do and i was i was glad it was asia because she was badass yeah um so much so that even jensen called it out i think mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) well i mean he he was our fourth wall breaker anyways so yeah like he was a hair away from being you know a deadpool yeah yeah really was uh, it, it's it's interesting it's like I know I wasn't quite paying attention to it while I was watching the film uh, and something I'd probably notice more on a on a f- repeat viewing um, so apparently each location they actually had a set color palette for mm, I saw I saw something about that and when you think back right yeah you you see it yeah and it, it definitely comes off like it would in comic panels. Yeah. Uh, yeah, apparently that was actually something that was kind of pulled from the comics, like that limited color panel uh, palette. Um, and you saw it in, in some of the shots, too. It's just like they, again, they position themselves a lot of times in like that Aisha one with that good silhouette, mm. which is a very big thing in, especially in any drawn medium. So seeing that translate was was nice. I'm looking, just taking a quick glance at at the directors you're wondering about comics. I see a couple of comic related things. Like he did did some stuff for the Umbrella Academy as well. Most of his stuff actually just looks more like TV stuff, honestly. Yeah, just random TV stuff. But I'm just wondering, like, just because you're a fan of doesn't mean like your prof- professional career career would go in that way. 
It's just the way that the shots were structured. I noticed a few times, like, with Pooch on the ground leaning up with the shotgun, like, yeah. the way that they would frame it, I was like, I, I could see that in a comic book panel. Yeah. Just the well, way it, that the, the shots were angled and placed. Yeah. Well, it, it's such an interesting thing, because comic books... Comic book movies go kind of either way, where, again, mm. you have some that are very... Where, I think we've discussed this before. It's like, I'm totally a fan, and that's why I'm going to change, change everything. everything. <laughs> <laughs> again, it, it's hard to say that, again, not knowing the source material. Uh, it'd be... But, I mean, I can say this. like Even just the movie poster is, like, the cover of Volume 1 of the comics. Mm. Right? So, there's definitely... And, again, yeah, as you said, they definitely captured the visual style of a comic so so yeah i would assume that i would assume that he's at least familiar <laughs> with with the medium and and, and a, a fan in general uh but yeah it's, it's yeah, i didn't get the feeling that you kind of get a sense for it. I didn't get the feeling when watching it that the director was a fan of the losers. Mm -hmm. I, I got a feeling that he was a fan or at least respected the medium of comic books. Yeah. Or graphic novels. Like, uh, just the way it was structured and him bringing uh, in the creators. Yeah. Like, you can tell I mean, that we, had an effect there. Yeah, and I mean, we've seen that in in other movies we've already talked about on the channel right? mm -hmm. like um again you know silent hill dread they you can tell that the person was a fan of what they were working on right like directly for the the series or the this the series itself where in this yeah. one like i guess to over explain I definitely didn't get that feeling. I got the feeling that he was a fan of the medium. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a, a good example, I think, of a director who is like that, that, you know, people go like this or around, or, you know, or go like this around, is um, Snyder. Mm. Regardless of which way his films go, you can tell he's a he's a fan of the comic book medium mm. right there and i mean you see it in the movie choices he's done you know like 300 and obviously that you know the dc universe and and even his original work sucker punch right which, which i'm fairly certain was completely original it feels like a comic book right so, so yeah there's definitely something to that being a fan of the medium. Mm. Um, I guess Tarantino um, with Kill Bill, you can tell again, very much a fan of anime as a medium. Yeah, definitely. Just pull that right. Definitely a fan so, of feed as a medium. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Who isn't? <laughs> exactly. Speaking of like film as a medium or comics as a medium, there's one thing that I actually had to go and fact check. It was like the first thing I wrote down and then had to cross it out. Mm. The very opening voiceover with the American flag and Chris Evans giving a very cap speech. <laughs> I'm like, oh, cool. They're calling back that role. And I was like, no. Oh, this that is American pre came out for a year after. <laughs> this movie came out a year before that. I'm like, crap <laughs> this this is one of the reasons why i had problems with uh captain america is it because i was familiar with him as jensen mm. okay. him and his him and his traps as jensen him and his dangle as jensen yeah him and All his right. petunias as jensen and then i like see him running around with the the cap app shield see the 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 one for for evans that I had to take a second to go over um, for Captain America and 
I, I love I love the cat like Winter Soldier. I think is one of the better MCU ones, but I had to get over him being Johnny Storm. Oh, I had completely forgot about that, and now I like this movie a little bit less. <laughs> It took me a sec because I, I thought is that they were making um, a spoof of that. But I'm like, nope, I, I, I saw a little bit more of that Johnny Storm character there. And let's face it, Johnny Storm is probably one of the better parts of the <laughs> Fantastic Four. I don't know. You, you don't like the thing? Mr. Fantastic. You don't like Mr. Fantastic? He's really stretchy, bro. He can stretch. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, overall, uh, I I really enjoyed this movie. I I really did too. It it was laughs. It was fun. It wasn't gripping the you know the the edge of your seat. There was no jump in. You did have a couple like yeah, you go get them moments. Um, yeah, I knew the plot beats, but that's not a bad thing, <laughs> right? Yeah, I would, I would say, as far as this movie goes, if I were to rate this movie, I would say, out of six Special Forces Black Ops, only two are traitors, which means I would give this one a four out of six. All right. Yeah, I, yeah, I actually agree with that completely. It was what I wanted out of the film. Oh, Hunter, it, the, the trailers painted it right. The tone was perfect um, for what it was. It was self-aware without being campy. It obviously fell short in a few ways. Obviously, it's not, it's not saying Red Drum. It's not uh, Nicolas Cage. So it's not going to be perfection. But... In every way, every reason that you would go to see a movie like The Losers, it would fulfill. Yeah. So, I mean, rating it for what what it was, 100%. Yeah. But rating it overall, yeah. Uh, yeah. We got two betrayers in the myths. Yeah. Yeah, not nope, that. I, I agree. Uh, no major plot holes, with the exception of the... <laughs> the, the, the traitor the traitor bit at the with rogue where it just didn't feel yeah it, uh, it and again did. in that in that movie where they you generally don't care about that type of thing that's not bad <laughs> i i would love to see a second one uh mm -hmm. maybe not now i mean you have zoe with you know avatar guardian star trek uh I mean, Idris Elba is an institution himself. Yep. I just... Chris Evans, obviously. Um, yeah, Craig. <laughs> I mean, Chris, Chris Evans, he'll probably do a bunch of, like, super artful stuff now that he's done as captain. Is I, I kind of have to hope he goes back to just doing, like, some dumb comedies. Because let's face it, he did some dumb comedies <laughs> in the past. Well, I mean, I didn't find Fantastic Four that funny. <laughs> <laughs> You have to remember, he was in not another teen movie. <laughs> I never watched any of those. Those were never oh, okay. my go. <laughs> <All right. laughs> but I honestly would like to see some of the stuff Oscar did. Like he was in this and and in Pirates of the Caribbean, but yeah. it looked. I just did a glance, um, but it looked like a lot of the movies that he were were was a lot of the movies that he was in are all like spanish movies yeah uh yeah let me just apparently it was in the latest rambo but i haven't seen that yeah nothing really that pops out at me honestly if we were if we were to go and look at some of these i bet you like he's also an institution yeah it's definitely got a got a library behind him <laughs> Yeah, I would definitely like to check out some of the stuff uh, that he's been in. Um, I mean, Jason, Jason Patrick, you know, he was in Speed 2, Speed Faster. 
Lost Boys. <laughs> but they all sold it. That was that was another thing that I enjoyed. Yeah, I think that was the biggest thing. It didn't matter if they were over the top or not. Like they were, they were unique. They knew what their characters were. They played in it. They played it up in the right ways. Um, like Pooch going was like, "What is a stupid question day? Did I not?" Get? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to read the comics. I think it'd be interesting to see what it was, and you know. So I guess in that regards, it's kind of a good entry to media, um, because I'm interested to see how the world was done there. Mm -hmm. And I, I like the approaching it this way. Uh, I, I'm a bit of a heathen, as you know. I actually like to see the movie before reading the book or the source material, because yeah. the book or the source material is always better. <laughs> so if I enjoy the movie, I'm going to enjoy the book more. And if I've read the book ahead of time, it's going to make me enjoy the movie le less. Uh, so I, I am a bit of a heathen, but I, I think there's only uh, 30 some odd of the, the losers. So it's, yeah. it's not even a long read. Yeah. Um, yeah I think it's 36. Yeah. 36 uh, chapters, I guess. So mm. yeah, that's, that's not much. That's... Probably like half a day, like a half a day read type thing. Probably an evening. Yeah. <laughs> well, this has been Beardy and the Beast Media Club. Join us next time for the second wall for the seventh installment of our Carol and Tuesday. Or after that, for Media Club, where we'll be discussing the film Underwater. As always, you can check us out here or any of the other services or socials listed at beardyandthebeast.com. And if you had a good time, give us a like or a share. Peace. Later. <laughs>